So in that first part, we were looking at the idea that um, Jesus models for us what it means to be truly human and the key motivation in his life and, and for everything he did was to, to seek out the will of God and to live for the glory of God. And if that is true, then obviously that has massive implications for us because we are now kind of the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Jesus on the ground in our communities, as it were. And so we are the ones now called to kind of partner with God and to outwork the victory that Christ has won for us. And if that, if, if that is true, then we kind of, we must inherit that same vocation to live for the will of God and for the glory of God. And again, a quick kind of sampling of texts from Scripture in the New Testament make it clear that this is absolutely the case. So when Paul is writing to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says this. He says that he, speaking of Jesus, says that he died for all, so that those who live may no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died and was raised for them. Jesus died that we may no longer live for ourselves, but for him, his glory. Uh, in his first letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where he's discussing this idea of meat offered to idols, he, he says, whether you eat or drink, in whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. In Ephesians, a book we've looked at a few times, and the first chapter it says that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live now for the praise of his glory. In Romans chapter 14, kind of Paul says this, he says, we do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord. So, and these are just a kind of a small sample of, and we can multiply these examples over and over and over again. This idea that we are called to no longer live for ourselves, but for the glory of God, um, of God the Son and God the Father. We inherit that same vocation that Jesus himself paved, that way, that model that he's given us to live in. And so, some of you may have heard of this guy, I've, I've mentioned his name a few times, N.T. Wright. Uh, he's this New Testament scholar and he, he suggests this idea that Christians are meant to be these kind of these angled mirrors. And so these you have this mirror and uh, it kind of reflects light away from itself. And so on the one hand, light comes down from the Father, down from God, and then it bounces off into the world and in this sense in which we receive the blessings of heaven and we kind of they, we are conduits of the blessings of heaven out into the world but then also we take um, the praises of the world as it were the kind of the response of the world and then we deflect it back up into heaven back up into God and so I found this imagery of an angled mirror actually quite helpful that there's this constant kind of back and forth this priestly vocation of what it means to be human where um, blessings flow and praises flow and we are the conduit but we are never kind of the end goal the end result um, God may glorify us but we're always meant to kind of point away from ourselves at, uh, again and again and this is not easy to do and it's, it's not easy to do in any culture but particularly there's something about our culture at the moment there's something about society uh, in the West, where it's it's geared towards, it leans towards kind of self-glorification and self-promotion, that it's about kind of my name, it's about how many likes I get, the number of my followers, kind of my, um, my how many people share my posts, how many people like my brand, how many people know my name, or how famous am I, or uh, what about my glory, and and even the kind of the the best. Um, things that are happening, these beautiful kind of profound moments of kind of, of social justice at work in the world, uh, you can sometimes see even these people try and kind of leverage and manipulate these for their own self-promotion. There's this idea, um, this term that's come up, you might be aware of it, this idea of virtue signaling and it's the idea that we can present ourselves doing something or saying something that suggests that we support this virtuous or righteous cause uh, whilst actually not in substance, in reality, not actually doing anything at all about it. It's about presenting an image, as it were. 
And I was reading this article by this woman named Flora Winderbeck, and she says this about virtue signaling. She says, virtue signaling allows the virtue signaler to validate the perception of themselves as do-gooders without actually having done any tangible good. It, in this way, it divulges them also of any responsibility to actually do so. It's this idea, again, about image. It's about perception. It's projecting an image of myself as a virtuous person, as a good person, involved in all these kind of these, these great causes in the world, but never actually getting my hands dirty, never doing anything of any substance to actually engage with them on any level. It's, so it's about manipulation. Um, oftentimes, and, and, and tragically, it's about leveraging kind of a genuine need and, and injustice in the world for my own um, good or for my own glory. And this is exactly the type of thing that Jesus was um, saved his harshest words for the religious, again, the religious hypocrites. And in a kind of a, an incredibly sobering and, in a sense, terrifying statement, Jesus. Um, is condemning these, these hypocrites and he says they have received the reward in full and he's talking about the praise that they have received from men and so imagine this that you kind of you live your whole life and there's this expectation that when you get to heaven you're going to receive this reward and then when you get there you realize actually you have nothing at all stored up for you because you've spent your whole life receiving the adulation and praises for men and, mot and being motivated by your own fame and your own glory and not God's and all of a sudden you realize that you, there's a bankruptcy in your, your heavenly account as it were, that there is nothing there for you, that you have traded in this kind of this eternal God ordained glorious reward for this fickle temporary praises of, of others. And that is incredibly sobering to me because I know my own heart and I know I'm not always pure. And, and so it, it gave me cause for concern and kind of sent me back to that place of God, Lord, have mercy on me and, and on my heart and on my motivations. And so I began to ask the questions, okay, what can, what, if that, this is the case, what on earth do we do about it? And going back to that, that, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us, gives us some ideas, he gives us some keys. And one of the things he talks about uh, in chapter six, again, in response to this hypocrisy, he says, learn to develop a spirituality of the secret place. Learn to develop or to do things that nobody else will see except God. When you give money, do it in secret so that no one sees. When you serve, do it in secret. When you worship, do it in secret. Consistently do these deeds of goodness and of righteousness, but do them under the radar, as it were. Discipline yourself to be okay with not getting recognition from men, with knowing and carrying this sense of confidence that God the Father sees and He is the one that will reward you and glorify you and praise you in response. And I think as you do this, your heart will begin to be transformed because you will begin to kind of, in a sense, put uh, a deposit, an investment into the eternal, into the heavenly. And that will kind of draw you away from the need, from the, the again, the fickle praises and the temporary praises of our peers and those around us. Um, but... I recognize that if we are consistent, if there is integrity in the good works that we do, then uh, we have to do them in public as well. We, it's not like we can just not start not being good in public just for the sake of it. It's, there will come a moment, there will come a time where people, uh, will, you will have to do good works, acts of righteousness that will be seen by others. And when people respond in kind of in positivity and maybe in praise uh, for you, then the question is, well, how then do we uh, deal with this? How do we kind of as Christians uh, respond to this? And I think this is where we really have to begin to kind of really settle and keep setting in the idea of ultimately what are we about? What are we living for? What are we giving for? What is the motivation for getting up in the morning, for the choices that I make in my life? Am I living for my own glory, my own comfort, my own name, or am I um, have I been kind of caught up in this story to the degree? Have I been so captured by the, uh, the radical love and the grace of God that I respond by giving myself fully and wholly um, to his plans and in his purposes? Will we, will I, 
will uh, allow myself, allow ourselves to point beyond ourselves and back to God, or will we keep the glory for ourselves? And this is this is challenging. Again, our, our culture is difficult because people will often stand and applaud when we seek to live out the kind of the great commandment to love our neighbor. When we get involved with social justice stuff, and and I'm, I'm fully on board with that, and I think we need to do more of it, not less of it, but. Um, Oftentimes, culture will stand back and will, will applaud us for doing these things. But the pushback oftentimes comes, or we kind of we or we talk about the other great commandment of loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and talking about the idea that we are created and fashioned and designed to live for His will and then for His glory. And my concern is that sometimes we get involved with these 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 projects, and, and we are. There's, there's a, a contentment almost with, with just doing good works, with just loving our neighbor. And we've become maybe slightly less concerned about God being glorified in this. But again, if we go back to the scripture, Jesus was immovable about this. It was almost primarily, it was about the Father. It was about the glory of God in all that he said and all that he did. And for Paul, it was the same. He was just carried this zeal. He carried this passion that... Um, that everything that he did, the good works, the mercy, the deeds of righteousness, the signs and the wonders, his preaching, everything would point um, back to the glory of Christ and glory of God the Father. And so if we are living in ways that will provoke people to ask questions uh, about why we are living the way that we're living, if there's a kind of integrity, if we're seeking first the kingdom of God, then undoubtedly questions might be might arise and, and then if people do kind of ask us, well, why, why are you getting engaged with this? Why are you doing this? Then maybe we, we can kind of seek to kind of uh, then talk about the story, talk about the good news. It doesn't mean you have to be this intense kind of bashing with the Bible, get 10 scriptures in every time an opportunity comes up. But it is this invitation to, well, let me tell you about the, the kingdom of God. Let me tell you about what God has done in my life all these things because again our lives are meant to be a sign they're meant to be a symbol pointing to something beyond ourselves we're meant to be living for something bigger than ourselves and i think that is inherent just in the heart of humanity that we long to be well to be involved in, in a cause and in a in, a, in a, a purpose that that transcends our kind of our small individual lives and this is understandable because this is what we were created for from the very beginning when God fashioned Adam and Eve uh, kind of out of the, the dust of the earth and from Adam's side. They were de we are designed, we're fashioned to be part of this bigger story and our kind of our hearts are restless until we find our place in that. And, and so, so this is where we will find our peace. This is where we will find our joy. This is where we will find our true satisfaction. As we, like Jesus, continually learn to pick up a cross, die to ourselves and live for others and particularly for the glory of God. And so at the gathering, we have this kind of little catchphrase that's on our website and it's on some of our literature. And it's this idea that we are called to live for the good of our neighbor, the flourishing of our community, and for the glory of God. And when we talk about that third thing, when we talk about living for the glory of God, it's not just this kind of this it's nice little religious catchphrase that we tack on to the end um, just to kind of make it a bit more spiritual. It's, it's this statement about uh, kind of who we are and our ultimate uh, purposes and motivation in the world we are called we are summoned we are invited we are designed we are fashioned in christ recreated in christ to no longer live for ourselves but for the glory of god and so again i'm just going to leave it there um, and we're going to kind of uh, discuss this in our groups again